KCF Technologies presents Industrial Transformation, Stories of Failure and Success from the Front Lines of American Manufacturing. Welcome back. I am Jeremy Frank and just absolutely thrilled to be back for another installment of this interview series on our podcast. And I have been looking forward to this for a couple of weeks now because we have as our guest on the show today, a very special guest. We have Dr. Jeffrey Liker, who is the international best-selling author of The Toyota Way, 14 Management Principles from the World's Greatest Manufacturer, which I, I personally consider to be one of the, the greatest business books and especially manufacturing books of all time. It really helped to explain the story of what makes Toyota so special from a manufacturing and leadership standpoint. Uh, Jack, Dr. Liker is also uh, the force behind Liker Lean Advisors, which is a professional uh, consulting group with doing coaching seminars and consulting based on the Toyota way and is uh, serving as a professor of industrial and operations engineering at the University of Michigan. So welcome and thank you so much for joining us today, Jeff. Thanks for having me, Dan. Yeah, really, really looking forward to getting into this conversation. I, if I may, I'd like to just just kick it off in in general. You know, when we talked the, the few times as we've gotten to know each other, our company's vision, KCF's vision, uh, is to solve problems through the convergence of technology and people. And, you know, I know lean manufacturing is a very people-focused process. I wonder if you might start by just defining lean manufacturing for us uh, from, from your point of view. Well, as you know, Dan, the origins of what we now call lean manufacturing were the Toyota production system. And that was developed in, starting back in the 1930s and 40s in Toyota and then evolved over decades. And the uh, way it's usually represented is by a house. One pillar is just in time. And the idea is that you flow value to the customer on demand and you flow value through the system from suppliers to customers where each, the next process is your customer and you're giving that customer what they want, when they want, in the amount wanted. And then the second pillar is called Judoka in Japan, but also uh, often called built-in quality or stop and fix problems as they occur. And the idea is that you identify problems, surface problems, and learn about the system through the system telling you what's wrong, and then you very quickly respond, even to the point of shutting down the line if need be. And that rests on a foundation of stability. So you have to have your machines, your people, processes working at a stable pace correctly with good, good quality uh, to, to meet customer demand. And then in the center, the center point of the whole model are people who are motivated, flexible, and trained to continuously improve processes. Uh, the goal is cost, quality, delivery, safety, and morale. So that's the house. And it's represented as a house, as a system where all these parts interact with each other. So for example, if you have a lot of inventory, there's no pressure to fix the machine or to fix a process uh, because you're, working off of inventory and the next process is just going to keep going once you connect processes to, together with very little inventory or one piece flow ideally one process shuts down the next shuts down the next shuts down everybody has to respond and solve the problem or they can't make anything so that connects to built-in quality where you're surfacing problems and the system's actually surfacing problems for you uh, and as you solve those problems, you become more and more stable, which allows you to solve fewer problems and spend more time on them. When you have a crisis and everything's a problem, you're just fighting fires. And then who does the problem solving? It's people who are at the center of the system who are trained in problem solving. And that's a skill set that people don't naturally have. They have to be trained to do a good job of identifying the problem, the root cause, uh, coming up with ideas, testing those ideas until they 
achieve the desired goal. So that I, I really appreciate you, you know, being one of the, the gurus that helps define this and explain it to the world. I appreciate you defining that. Clearly, that is a, a very people centric um, system, you know, continuous right. problem solving, uh, continuous improvement. This happens with people and by people. What I, I wonder, you know, so many there's, there's so much technology talk these days and we're very much riding the wave of, of technology and we're caught up in this industry 4.0 wave to some extent, but we're not, we're trying to not get caught up in it, but in fact, to do it best, to do it the right way. From your point of view, you know, if you take an automated factory, people, let's say like a fully 100% automated factory, people talk about a, like a dark factory, which almost implies that there's no people there. How does lean apply in an automated factory? If you were truly dark, which means there's no people there, which means the machine is maintaining itself. Uh, and then you could design it through just technical requirements, such as just in time, everything flows without interruption, you know, put in huge inventory buffers and you would design with sensors, you can identify problems immediately and fix them, correct them immediately. So in that sense, the technical part of the Toyota production system would still apply. Uh, but the people who are in the center would go away. So that would be one extreme. Now, we're nowhere near, I don't think anybody thinks we're near the point where technology can diagnose and, and maintain itself and keep itself running without human intervention. But that would be you know, one extreme. Then the other extreme are purely manual processes where people are thinking and doing the work. And then in between are, are machines, but there are people in some way intervening which is more typical in an automated factory where the people make adjustments, they might change over the product from one to another. Uh, they're doing maintenance, preventative maintenance, they're monitoring the machine and reacting when they see a problem. So in most automated systems, people are still at the center, even though they're not doing the manual work, although they may do, do some manual work. Uh, one thing that's interesting was is that uh, a few years ago, I visited Toyota and I was visiting a completely automated plant that does forging and machining for engine and transmission parts. So metal, steel parts that are being cut and shaped. And the parts run through a series of machines uh, automatically. And all the person is doing is monitoring, changing over, uh, changing tools and uh, reacting to the problems. With the interesting about the thing about this is the plant was run by a student of Teichi Ono, the father of the Toyota production system. And he had been in this plant for over 40 years. And he was kind of horrified that a lot of young people were being hired in as either operators or engineers or maintenance people. And they never experienced forging or machining. Mm. And their view of what their job was, was to push a button and start the machine and wait for a part to come out. And mm -hmm. he said he didn't want push button team members or push button engineers. He wanted people who were thinking. So what he did was to come up with a variety of different ways to get them, to challenge them to think. One was that he took an old manual line that had been in South America and the plant closed down and he brought it to his plant and set it up and everybody had to go through the manual line and do the work manually and come up with ideas for improvement for Kaizen ideas. So they had to spend a week or two learning Kaizen on a manual process. And they're making uh, specialty items, small, small volume specialty items that were for sale, but really the purpose was for training. Another thing he did was he called it My Machine, where each operator was told, this is your machine. I want you to study what happens to the part. And his view was that T TPS is TPS, that it's all about the part being transformed into something the customer wants without waste. So he wanted them to, to see second by second, and they even had stopwatches with hundreds of a second, uh, what was happening to that part as it moved into the machine, it was machined, it was moved to the next machine and he wanted them to identify the value added and the waste. Uh, so they had to look at the machine and 
he even had them do the sh do it manually because uh, they needed to know that if the machine broke down. And then they had to draw, not not write tables, but draw a picture of what was happening. And they had these very elaborate pictures that explained a hundred different things that were happening to this part. And then based on that, he wanted Kaizen ideas. How can you redesign this machine so that there's less waste? Mm -hmm. And that led to better throughput, but also they're able to shrink. At some point, they cut in half the uh, the footprint of the machines. That, of course, meant that they had to go to the equipment vendors, and you had hourly production workers telling the equipment manufacturers how to redesign their machine. And then they had to do it and, and do the design and make the changes. Uh, now, one of the cute things he did, it was like very clever, was he went to the supervisors of the production team members and said, I'm asking the team members to study the machine and to come up with ideas for improvement. And they're going to be coming to you with questions. So I know you know these machines, you can answer their questions, but it's very important that you have good answers to their questions. Now he knew full well the supervisors didn't know how the machines worked. Mm. So now he put pressure on the supervisors to understand the machines in order to answer these questions and not look like a fool. Mm. Uh, so all, this was all focused on number one, how do you train people so they really know what's going on? And number two, how can you use people who are there standing in front of the machines to Kaizen the actual equipment itself? So it wasn't enough just to keep it running. He wanted them to improve it. And then he's been spreading this way of teaching all over Toyota. He's now on the board of directors of the company on responsible the board of for, Toyota. Toyota. for Toyota. Yeah. Uh, the other thing interesting is, is that uh, this was a perfect model of the role of the person in an automated environment which is to be a thinker and problem solver and continuously improve, not to be just a monitor that could be replaced by cameras and software. Hmm. I'm curious, you know, Jeff, the, uh, I mean, we, our company has some of these, some of these technologies are beginning to be deployed. You know, you talked along the way there about in an automated factory where you might have technology automatically diagnose, you know, machine health. That is in fact happening today. Our company's doing that at companies, you know, in, including Toyota and some of the auto manufacturers, but it's starting on the relatively simple systems where the behaviors are, you know, are the ones that you can tackle most readily. I'm curious, how do you think that will, how, what's the best way to drive adoption? So that, right. So you've got, an increasingly automated factory, but certainly that's far off into the future to be fully automated. Most processes involve a lot of people doing both thinking and hands-on uh, work. But now you start to have technology that can automatically tell you how healthy or unhealthy something is from a lean point of view, you know, rather than just, you know, your eyes and ears and smell and, and fingers telling you what's going on. What's the ideal way for that to be incorporated into a continuous improvement process? Well, according to Mr. Kawai, the guy I mentioned from Toyota, uh, who's a TPS expert and he's run automated factories, he still wants the people to have the craft knowledge to understand, say, machining, and to be able to do the process by hand if, say, everything shut down, the computer's all shut down. Uh, but he thinks that knowledge is is really necessary for continuous improvement of the systems, whether it's the computer systems, the user interface, the uh, physical hardware. He wants people to be sensing and improving the system. Now, any information you give them has to pass the test that it's value added, which means it's giving them information that's either that that's either faster or that they can't get through the senses as well that is going to help them to diagnose and solve problems. Mm -hmm. If you can't do that, it's not value, valuable. Now, the interesting thing is the less you develop people, the less you invest in developing people, the more useful, in a sense, the technology will be because they're just dumb and the machine has some smarts and the computer system can think of things that they didn't or, or point out things they hadn't thought of. 
the more masterful the people in the system are, the higher the bar for giving them useful information. It may be things they can sense and they're obvious to them without the technology. So you have to understand the what you're trying to accomplish, what the purpose is and the condition of your people and the systems to know where the problems are and what that what information adds value rather than just pushing information, assuming that it must add value because it makes sense to you as a technology provider. It's so fascinating because, you know, it's funny. A couple of things are going through my mind as you talk. You know, I know you're at the University of Michigan, our company, and I've, you know, spent a good bit of time there, but our company came out of Penn State University. And we actually have, uh, there, there's a place called the Learning Factory that's part of, that's part of the engineering uh, college here. And it's actually for that very purpose as, as a student, you know, I was a student there. You actually use a milling machine and you use a grinder and you use a sandblaster. You do all these things with your hands that you eventually, you know, see being employed at a much larger scale in manufacturing. But that's what is next in my head. I'm, I'm picturing now, you know, when you go to these stamping lines, for example, in a modern auto manufacturing facility, these machines are, you know, 50 feet tall, a couple football fields long. And they're doing work that no human being could possibly do. I mean, they're making a part every like three to four seconds. It's the hood of a car or whatever. And, you know, it's, it's just we're so far removed from where a, a human being could learn how to like form that part. Uh, and so what I see then is that you have, you know, it's sort of like this, this in between where the, the technology is sort of used to gather that valuable information on the things that that no human being could safely get, I think is where you know where I'm seeing that inter intersection. Does that can you see that working? Like it, that basically in your example, you know, from Toyota's standpoint, it would be that you know the the operator knows how to form a part, you know, but only on a very small, you know, much older small scale could you actually do that. But now to apply that small scale knowledge onto a you know full on industrial machine equivalent and then it's almost like you're you're imagining these small little working parts that are part of this football field sized system and it can tell you it can like feed you information that helps you run that machine better do, do you follow me on that yeah i do uh i've worked with a number of different companies that are in process industries that process food or that process metal uh worked for a while with james hardy that makes uh hardy boards the boards you put in in your shower when you're going to put uh put tile in uh and they make uh they make uh siding for houses made of cement and i've, I've worked in a bunch of different process industries that have these football size lines and they uh kind of run themselves they're completely automated you don't touch anything as an operator and we did things like set up a daily management system where there's a team of people and they meet at the beginning of the shift and they've been trained in problem solving and they set up some visuals of how the machine's operating and record how the machine is operating during the day and they turn into problem solvers and one of the things i've noticed for first of all is that if you ask them, they will tell you that when Joe runs this machine, who's been here for 30 years, everything runs like clockwork. Hmm. And then they turn it over to Fred and the machine keeps going down. Hmm. And we just train the operators, use visual management, and get them and to train them in problem solving. And we've gotten 30 to 50% throughput improvements hmm. without changing the technology at all. So what it tells me is that there is that there's a lot of different kinds of adjustments the operator can make or responses to problems that don't happen automatically. Uh, now, you know, maybe they can some someday with the, these new technologies, but today they're not happening. And the operator needs some skill to be able to keep the machine running at a high level. Uh, so now if you give that operator better information, again, my view is you always start with the problem. You always start in, in Toyota Japanese terms, you go to the Gemba. 
you study the machine, you study different causes of downtime, you try to understand uh, how the operator thinks about the the process and and the machine, and then you identify you know the if we could get these five things to the operator in real time, it would make a big difference. And then you ask, what's the best way to get that information to the operator? So it's visible, present, really easy to uh, to quickly interpret, you know, the user interface. Uh, and then you train the operator to respond with creative problem solving when they see a problem. You know, if I may, yeah, Jeff, that, you... put, put, it, put that all together and then you have a whole system. But simply let some IT people say, I think these 15 things would really be useful for the operator to know. And they're not thinking too much about the user interface. They don't understand the problems the equipment actually faces. They're likely to add a bunch of waste. Yeah, I, I just, there's something that you hit a nerve with me on the, um, you know, those different operator, the, like the the things that an operator can affect and in, in comparing two different operators, I, we see that. I, I've seen, you know, very clear results of that. For example, if you're looking at the the health like a, like a trend that's diagnosing the health of a machine, a big machine in one of these factories. It's very common. We've been doing this for years where you'll see when, when they have their shift change, the, you'll, you'll see a very recognizable, you know, eight or 10 hour pattern of different behavior that has to do with the choices that that operator makes. And, and yet most companies, at least most companies we interface with, they they don't have good regular communications between the maintenance team and the operations team, you know, for right. example. But what you just described is no doubt that I, I've seen the evidence that, that is, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit there for the taking. Right, right. So uh, one, of the, one company I worked with, a, a Japanese bearing company, their policy is that they keep people together and they rotate shifts. So if you're on the first shift with your team, your team now goes to the second shift together intact and you're you're going back and forth, which they did brought that to America and the Americans hated it, but they managed to do it anyway. But uh, their, their thinking was, we don't want a bad shift that the poor operators go to. And we want the shift to remain intact so that the communication patterns get established. This is a team, they need to work together and have experience working together. So they went to that degree, and that is pretty common in Japan, and and people hate it in, in the United States and try to avoid it. But uh, that just gives you an idea. The other thing they do is it's very common to have, in, in a lot of American companies, Western companies, it's not unusual to have a central maintenance pool, and you can send them wherever there's a problem, and that gives you, as the head of maintenance or the scheduler of maintenance, complete flexibility to just send anybody, any place who's available. And what you'll see is zone maintenance. And uh, one in one Toyota plant, they would call this the home doctor. Hmm. And they wanted the maintenance person to be like a home doctor of decades ago that would come to your home and would be your doctor for 40 years and would know the kids and their birthdays and every disease hmm. they ever had. Uh, they wanted the the... the maintenance people to be assigned to machines and, and and team members and to know what the problems are so that they can almost instantly communicate with the team member and figure out what needs to be done. Hmm. So Jeff, I'm, I'm curious if uh, when, when we first talked, I don't know, a few, maybe it was a month ago, I, you know, this is a, this is just a, a great conversation about sort of how these things can best be implemented. I'm curious to hear from you a bit about what you observe today. Like what's what's happening? You you told me a story about some travels you've had in Japan recently, and then you know in different parts of the United States. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about the story that you told me and what you're seeing with with you know modern manufacturing? Yeah, because that was a uh, Denso Corporation, Toyota's bigger supplier and and one of the biggest suppliers in the world of auto parts. And they're making electronic parts and heating, ventilation, air conditioning units, and mo much of what they do is is automated. And they have been because of that, they have been, say, a little bit more technologically focused than Toyota for decades. Although they have learned the Toyota production system and they practice it, 
but they, they their tendency would be to uh, introduce new technology more quickly than Toyota. Uh, and they were starting in Japan to introduce uh, IoT, Internet of Things technologies, in a few very, very small areas in a very careful way. And I happened to, and I want, had some questions about what I saw in Japan. So they connected me with Raja, a guy who's in the United States. And I met him and he just blew me away because he had worked within the Denso system in engineering. And he understood the equipment, he understood the culture, he understood uh, the Toyota production system very well through, through experience. But he had got very excited about the new technologies that were being developed in the United States. And he said, from a software point of view, from artificial intelligence point of view, sensors, IoT, the U.S. is the center. And he said, there's nothing like Silicon Valley in Japan. So he saw as his mission to educate Denso about all these new technologies and demonstrate how powerful they can be. He set up as a pilot, and I always think, it's a good idea to pilot, and it's very natural within the Toyota Group. So in Battle Creek, Michigan, he started to pilot these technologies, introducing them so that they fit as a system with the their version of Lean and with their investment in people. And he started to get great results. Uh, things like uh, sensors on fans in huge ovens uh, that would sense the temperature and the vibration and speed of the machines and warn you that there was going to be a problem before maintenance people even realized there was a problem. Uh, and even getting into sacrosanct areas like standard work, which is kind of like the Bible within Toyota, that you have standard work and you have to write it out by hand. And he collaborated with a Stanford University professor on motion technology that uses video cameras and videos the person doing the job and then chunks it up you could say, here's the steps, here's a chart of how long each step takes, here's the bottleneck step, uh, and then you could manipulate the standard work, you know, what the person does, and in real time see what effect it has on productivity. So he's been kind of gaga, he loves this technology, but he's introducing it in the Toyota way, so I get to see that up close. His experience was that when he benchmarked other companies who he thought were way ahead of Denso, in using IoT and Industry 4.0 technologies, he found in many cases they had what he called uh, IoT wallpaper. <laughs> they had really nice screenshots of things and it looked great, but when you went to the floor, they weren't actually using the data for problem solving. Hmm. And then he would go to a best practice company that a vendor had set him up with, and he was really disappointed and then he would tell them what they're doing at Denso and they'd come out to his place and they'd be blown away. And they might've had 50 people working on this and he has less than 10, but they, their, their surprise was, wow, you're actually using this to solve real problems. I can't believe it. And we haven't gotten to that point yet. So it turns out that they were more technologically advanced, but he was more advanced in the application to solve real problems, making it really work to add value. And it was because of the combination of lean systems, people who are developed to solve problems. He also included on his software development team, uh, some people who had shifted from quality on the floor to software development. They just were, were naturally good at software development. So he had people developing the software, developing the systems who understood what was going on on the floor. And as well as some people that were big data analysts and you know, knew the software and they worked together as a team. So it was very natural for them to go out to the floor and say, here are the biggest problems we face. How can we address these problems rather than how can we push all the latest technology onto the plant? Address the problems. Yeah. And I wrote about that and I have a principle in the Toyota way about adopting technology to enable the people and processes. And I, use Denzel as an example, because I think it's a brilliant example that demonstrates, number one, it is still as important to have thinking, creative people solving problems, and the technology can enable that at a higher level. And the second thing is that the technology does have value. The combination of the new technology, which is being, as you know, 
developed at an incredible pace and there's breakthroughs every day. Uh, the, this new technology is really powerful in the hands of people who understand the process, think creatively and can solve problems. So that combination is a real winner. Certainly. Yeah. Yeah. We've seen that. And that, you know, when you shared that story, of course, it was the, it was just fascinating to, you know, to note from our point of view that KCF has actually been very directly involved with Ra the same Raja from Denso who's driving that program forward. And it is, that's the, that's the life we've been living for a while is just try to have that convergence of technology, but with people who can actually solve problems. And that's the, I think that's the thing that's been so hard for so many companies to, um, to wrap their head around. And he but does, wonder, Raja does see that. I asked him if there would be less people in the future. And he said, there'll be less people in the future in the factory as the technology takes on more basic manual tasks. Uh, I asked him if the skill level of the people will decrease because the technology is doing more of the thinking. He was convinced the skill level they need in the future is a higher level of skill that a maintenance person will become like an engineer uh, and interpreting complex wave diagrams and uh, trends and patterns and using that information. So he thinks that, that, that the result will be a smaller number of people who are upskilled. Yeah, uh, we certainly great. see that every, every we, we talk about it as elevating, you know, people are often scared that the technology is going to take their jobs and it isn't. I mean, I, I think it is possible that the robot is going to take their jobs or the automated manufacturing line is going to take the manual job. But, at, you know, absolutely the information driven technology, uh, it, it elevates people's job is the way that we always, that we've been seeing it for years. I, I wonder, Jeff, just, uh, um, wow, this has been a fast conversation. We're almost, we're not close to running out of time yet, but I, there's one thing I really, I wanted to make sure I asked you just kind of categorically. So you, you've been hearing a lot about industry 4.0 and IOT, and we've been talking about it. I wonder if you could just describe how, from your point of view, how does, how does lean apply in industry 4.0 or maybe more appropriately, how does industry 4.0 fit into lean from your point of view? Okay. So there's a technical side to lean and then there's the human side that I've been talking about. And the technical technical side is that the ideal is one piece flow and, uh, Denzo, in addition to uh, do it, use, starting to use the software, they have worked a lot on the hardware side, and they've taken cases where they have huge machines that make huge batches of uh, machine parts or forged parts and heat treat them in huge ovens, and then they move them in huge batches with, uh, with cranes even. Uh, to another area and another area, and they finally get to an assembly operation where there's manual assembly. And they've taken those lines and reduced them to one fifth to one tenth of the size and built in very simple, small heating processes uh, right into the one piece flow line and then automated most of the process, most of the assembly process. And these are like tiny things. They look like toys. So there's one plant I visited where you could see the old stuff and it was huge and it looked like uh, real manufacturing. And then the, the new line was about 30 yards and it was so microscopic that it almost looked like toys. <laughs> uh, but a few of those lines could do the work of, of these, the rest of the factory. Uh, so that process of getting to one piece flow, small, simple machines that that and where that follow one piece flow where you can see the problem very quickly when it occurs as opposed to the old machines that you know, heat treat a bunch of stuff and by the time anybody actually starts to use those parts it's taken a week or so so then they discover a problem that occurred two weeks ago whereas on the one piece flat flow line they'll find a problem that occurred three minutes ago so that concept of striving for one piece flow I think applies equally well, whether you're using this new technology or not. And I see companies that have that old technology and they have so much waste and so much inventory and there's such big time gaps from when the uh, machine produces something to when it gets assembled and tested. Uh, and for them, it's obvious that this new technology isn't gonna do much good at all. 
you know, they can monitor that one big oven and maybe increase the throughput a bit, but that's not the problem. The problem is the overall structure and flow of the whole plant. So the kinds of things you would do technically with lean, you would do anyway, uh, you'd like to do anyway, maybe before automating mm. or before adding the, adding the Internet of Things. And that's been a, sort of a common theme for me working with companies is that when they talk about adding, it used to be MRP2 and complex scheduling methods, and they need a new oven that's state of the art. And they would describe all this stuff that they need. And it was clear that they were doing nothing to improve the processes that is, existed today. So I'd ask them, you know, what could you do right now to improve the process? And they would say, nothing. We're waiting on the technology. When's it going to come? Well, the heat treat oven's going to come in the third quarter, and we'll, we should have it running by the fourth quarter. And you know, so they're talking about months to years to get the new MRP2 system. And in the meantime, they thought they couldn't do anything. And I said, you know, I just walked through your factory. I could see 15 things you could do before I leave today. Hmm. And so it really had killed the spirit of Kaizen. So, you know, the gen general wisdom within Toyota is first get the manual operation working as well as you can. And the more you simplify it, the easier it then will be to automate. And then you'll also know where the problems are because you're, you're not seeing everything's not a problem. They're more focused problems. So you could then ask, how can we use IoT to help us with these problems? Not how can we help, how can it help us solve problems? How can it help us solve these particular problems that we know we have hmm. and that we haven't been able to solve uh, so far? Sure. So it just changes the whole game. So I, when I see a mass production operation that's poorly organized, poorly designed, poorly laid out, people aren't well trained. I know that the technology isn't going to solve the problem. And I also know that the people running that operation are, are wishing for a silver bullet, wishing for to be able to buy something that solves the problems for them. And that silver bullet's never going to come. I mean, I silver bullet's never going to come. Any more than, you know, if you're way overweight, you suddenly, you know, get the pill that makes you lose weight and you don't have to change your diet. You don't have to change your exercise habits. And it just doesn't work that way. Yeah, in manufacturing and life. I wonder, can so you know, clearly you're passionate about this and you're incredibly well informed and you've been you've been observing this for decades. I, I'm really curious, you know, and, and the whole focus, you know, is problem solving. Continuous improvement is basically just, you know, habitual problem solving. I want I'm I'm curious to know from your point of view, what do you personally find to be the biggest remaining problem? that needs to be solved, especially in this, you know, the convergence of lean and industry 4.0, or just, you know, manufacturing in general, what is the problem that you wish you could just snap your fingers and solve? I would be happy to snap my fingers and suddenly the COO and the CTO and even the CEO and certainly the plant managers, suddenly they would have this awareness startling awareness of how important people thinking people as problem solvers are mm. and they would and they would understand the craft aspects you know what what role does craft knowledge play in our manufacturing process and how can we marry that with the technology and by the way we've got a cto who really understands the technology and we have a ceo who really understands manufacturing, maybe grew up with it. And those people need to work together and they need to work to get to work with human resources to kind of figure out where, where the people are in the plant in their training and skill development. And how can we do something like Mr. Kawhi and Toyota to create opportunities to learn by doing, to learn hands-on to solve problems. So they would see a huge value in collaboration and testing and trialing and investing in developing people. And it would become so natural to them that they couldn't imagine is that if somebody came through and said, you know, I can give you a 50% throughput increase just by adopting my software or my technology, they would say, ah, I doubt it. <laughs> you know, they would be skeptical. Right. And they couldn't imagine just accepting that 
without having the internal capability to be able to continue to improve and without having people ready and able to uh, contribute to problem solving. So I would like that. So what I, you know, what I normally see is the CTO has a proposal to spend millions of dollars on uh, new technology and the CEO is excited about the technology and there's a business case based on how many people, how many jobs could be eliminated. And in the meantime, you've got lean people who are kicking around in the factory, working with the frontline people and improving things and making a difference, but, and maybe costing a few hundred thousand dollars. And this, it's not visible to the CEO or to the CTO or even COO. They're kind of cool th projects, but if push come to shove, they're going to ask the lean people to get out of the way because they have to introduce the new technology. We've experienced that a bunch of times. We've experienced it with the ERP where all the people we were working with got pulled off to implement the ERP, which was failing. So, uh, you know, that, that would be my dream is just the mindset of understanding the value of marrying lean concepts, people and the technology. Yeah. It's, it's beautiful. I, I love it. I love the description that you lay out. And I mean, I, We'll, we'll continue talking because we know companies that where, you know, the CEO, COO, CTO are committed, even the CFO, which has typically been the hardest <laughs> for right. us to track. But we, we have seen it and most are certainly not, but it is, it is wonderful when you see an organization committed like that. I wonder, you know, if, if you look into the future, then, you know, we're in this, we're in this, I, I think this uh, certainly inflection point. There's, there's a lot of change going on. And certainly there's a lot of change possible driven by technology and just kind of urgency and need. And especially we've got this COVID crisis, you know, thrown at us globally. If you look, you know, the longer view, I always like to think like 10 years out or maybe 20, I think 10 years in the auto industry, we've got electric vehicles, we've got self-driving cars, we've got all these different new entrants. And then we've got the things that have already been playing out for decades, which is some pretty massive upheaval. Um, what do you think, like, where, where do you think we'll be in 10 years and, and especially in a positive sense, like what are the things that you sort of wish for or hope for that are evolving over the next decade or so? In, well, the other, we, we've talked about manufacturing, but we haven't even talked about design, the design side and the, uh, the old story from when I started studying this back in, uh, 1982 was simultaneous engineering, concurrent engineering. How do you design the product so it could be manufacturable? And how do you get the engineers doing product development to be thinking about the way the product was gonna be produced? And uh, mostly companies weren't good at that either. Uh, they were buying software that was integration software or, or software that would uh, simulate things so that they didn't have to run real tests. So they're trying again to just take out people work and reduce labor rather than actually coming up with a system that was, uh, that was superior to their current system. So when you talk about autonomous vehicles and what impact will that have and uh, AI and electric vehicles, you're, you're now moving into the design part the design and engineering part and innovation part on the product. And often people will talk about those almost interchangeably. Like you're talking about the factory automation and then they'll be talking about autonomous vehicles like they're the same thing. Mm. Uh, now from the point of view of manufacturing, if you do a great job on developing AI for autonomous vehicles, I just wanna know where I stick the part. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't really care. You know, it's now a little, one computer module instead of five. So, I can put it in one place. I don't have to do five things. So you simplify the manufacturing job. You know, I'm, that's what I'm concerned about. Uh, I'm concerned about quality control that I can influence. That's not influenced by the programming. Uh, so, but I, I think you can design, and one of the things that Tesla has done very effectively is to simplify a lot of parts of the vehicle, including the computer systems. There's one computer system and uh, the air conditioning system, they've gone through the whole vehicle and they found ways to combine parts and simplify manufacturing. Now, automatically, when you take out the powertrain 
and you have a few electric motors and a battery system, it's so much simpler than a combustion engine. Uh, and there's so many fewer parts and the whole part of the industry, and the supply base and all these engine plants eventually will, will not be needed. They'll become obsolete. So that's a huge manufacturing imp impact on just taking away stuff. And the well, what's left is a lot simpler and the barriers to entry, the capital costs and the, the know-how of making engines is not necessary. So it starts, so that's why you start to see a lot of new entrants into the field. Uh, so I think that, but what, what Tesla also learned, they talked about production, Elon Musk talked about production hell, is that manufacturing was not as easy as he thought. And he tried to over automate and then he backed out, backed away and took, took uh, reduced some of the automation uh, in order to get cars made so they could sell. Uh, so I still think that there will be a craft to manufacturing, there'll be a craft to logistics, there'll be a craft to innovation and design. And I really talk in you know, my books about excellence. You know, the vision is excellence. And excellence to me are people who are trying to master their craft and people who are trying to make the system of software and hardware and people doing innovative design all work together. And I think that uh, the companies that do that will do beautiful things and cool things mm. that add value to society and most companies won't so uh, i still think the companies that combine the best of people with the best of process knowledge and the best of technology and really care about excellence will have a competitive advantage in the future mm. even though certain things we make today we may not we may not need to, to make in the future so there'll be uh, natural evolution of businesses going under and other businesses uh, opening up. Hmm. And you think, yeah, that those that those that truly get that convergence will will be the minority or the exception, not the rule. Yeah, I, I think that will continue to be the case. Yes, and I, I think I really, and I think, <laughs> my whole purpose in life is to have that uh, have most companies behave that way. But we well, yeah, be nice. We'll <laughs> and hey, as you I, know, you know, still minority, uh, but. What you're trying to do is increase the percentage. Right, exactly. So you're not going to increase it from 5% to 95%. If you can get up to 15 or 20%, you'd be doing really well. Uh, so, you know, we all do the best we can, but uh, uh, unfortunately, that what system thinking and really striving for excellence seems to be still a somewhat rare commodity. Yeah, truly. Yeah, truly. Well, Jeff, I, we are just about out of time. I have just one last question for you, and I could kind of guess how you might answer this, but I, I really, truly don't know. Um, the question is just on divergent thinking, and what, what I want to ask you is, what is what is the thing, like the most important thing that you really know to be true, something that's deeply held for you, but that most people would disagree with you about? Well, what comes to mind is that this whole idea of craft knowledge, and it goes back, in fact, to the book, The Machine That Changed the World, that defined lean. And the way they talked about it was as the best of mass production and craft production put together. It was not something where you go from mass production, we have big machines and economies of scale and uh, making widgets, individual widgets very efficiently uh, to now lean production that is small batch sizes and one piece flow and smaller special purpose machines. What you're doing is going back beyond mass production to the craft age where you had people using their senses who were trying to develop their craft at if they're apprentices at the hands of master, you have that operating in combination with mass production thinking, along with the idea of one piece flow on demand manufacturing. And that becomes a whole different paradigm, a whole different system. Hmm. Uh, so in Toyota, they still talk about using all your senses and they're very unhappy when they see people whose senses are dulled and are, who are willing to just let the machines do the thinking or fill up, mindlessly fill out forms. 
that that's like the worst thing. So they talk about TPS, the Toyota production system, as really being the thinking production system. So the belief in the value of people thinking and honing their craft still being valued, even in an age of this great new technology and automation and artificial intelligence, I don't think that's obvious to most people. And that's what I think is more of that is needed. Uh, now that when you tell that to somebody who's say responsible for IT in a large company, what they see that is regression, not progress. Uh, you're going to slow us down. You're going to hold us back. And you're a traditionalist, like a Luddite, who doesn't believe in the technology. And that's not true at all. It's certainly not true for Toyota. It's not true for Denso. Uh, there's a strong belief in the value of the technology when it addresses a clear problem and purpose and when people are thinking about how to use it and how to improve it. So that, to me, that's the the... The biggest surprise, which in a sense isn't a surprise, it sounds fairly traditional, but uh, it's actually pretty radical thinking when you're in this world of technologists who are just excited about the latest tool that they developed and proved out today. Yeah, certainly. I mean, I think even one, you know, from your book, I think certainly in the Toyota way, you know, the, the and also, you know, from the machine that changed the world, the fact that that existed during the early days of Ford and then, you know, for, I don't know, for a period of many decades was lost, but that Toyota actually studied the, the existence of those craft based behaviors scaled in an assembly line. And then it was essentially lost when the production volumes got so high. I just thought that was a, that's a fascinating angle. Well, right. Jeff, I, I actually, I'm, I'm watching the clock. I, I, um, we are out of time, unfortunately, I, I've, feel like, you know, this conversation is just absolutely fascinating, but I, um, I, I do have to wrap us up and I, I would just like to do that by saying thank you so much for sharing your thoughts today, but also more broadly, just for doing the work that you do. I, I think that the, you know, the Toyota way and the eight, I believe it's eight that have followed that are just up among my absolute favorites of all time. And I think they're really just a, a great contribution to the manufacturing world because there are, I mean, we have all of our employees read the Toyota way because I, I think it really tells the story of how to do things right in, in a masterful way. So I just want to say thank you for that. And also thank you for joining me in conversation today. Thank you for having me. And I just recently finished the Toyota way Two, the second edition of the Toyota way, which will be out in October of this year. And in that book, I've, updated it quite a bit to really emphasize the thinking that's necessary, which I refer to as scientific thinking. Talk about how, how unnatural it is. Talk about how the processes interact with the philosophy and with the people and with problem solving. And uh, I have the Denso example. I have more in the technology section on new technologies like IoT. Uh, I, the 14th principle is a new one that focuses on strategy and thinking ahead and being up to date on new technology and on new trends, but then incorporating it away so that you can deliver with excellent execution. Hmm. So you get the best of, uh, a lot of the lean stuff is more about execution and process improvement and not about the fundamental changes in the design of your product or service, but you can put those together. So uh, about 80% or more of the book is, is new, and revised. And I would ask you, Dan, to uh, give that to your employees. <laughs> uh, it's, it won't be redundant. And it's, there's a lot more up-to-date stuff. Yeah, I will absolutely be uh, awaiting that. And that comes out this, this fall, is that correct? Yeah, October? in October. Yes. October. Couple, couple yeah. Well, Jeff, thank you very much for, for that. I will absolutely look forward to that. And again, thanks for being on the podcast. I will, uh, I will close us off there. Once again, this is Jeremy Frank, and this is the Industrial Transformation Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Industrial Transformation Podcast, a production of Business Builders Media. Learn more about how KCF can help you on your industrial transformation journey at kcftech.com. And check out more shows on businessbuildersmedia.com.